Father's Arms, nestled in the beautiful foothills of Appalachia in the southeastern United States and northeast Alabama. Our Father's Arms is a place of healing and deliverance. Each day, we turn our hearts toward God's Word. There's 31 chapters in the book of Proverbs, one for each day of the month. The proverb for the day provides a springboard and commentary to the rest of Scripture. We invite you to join us as we relax, open our Bibles, and trust Him to speak to our hearts. Proverbs chapter 11. Dishonest scales are an abomination to the Lord but a just weight is his delight. And we know what those dishonest scales are. It's just living in deceit and undercover. And you know what the, um, we know everything's gonna be brought to the light, or do we know that? Do we really believe it when he says it? You know, he sees the secret things and in the kingdom of light, the most loving thing you can be is a snitch. In the kingdom of darkness, the most despicable thing you can do is is be a snitch because all those roaches and spiders and uh, that do their destroying in the darkness hate being exposed by the light and it saves someone's life oftentimes and, and prevents uh, a shipwreck when we go ahead and nip it in the bud and what's going on in secret is brought to the light because the Lord who sees everything says that dishonesty and living a lie is an abomination to him you know, saying one thing and, and uh, living another. That's what taking the Lord's name in vain is. It's when we talk the talk, but don't walk the walk. Don't come to the light. And that's a dishonest scales. Two, when pride comes, then comes shame. But with the humble is wisdom. Now, not only does pride bring shame uh, in the sense that we're exposed. You know, those who humble themselves will be exalted but those who exalt themselves will be humbled. Um, P-R-I-D-E, pitiful, rebellious, I, being deified and exalted. The I, me, my, lie, uh, selfish willy on the throne. Um, everyone wants to be number one, wants to own it all, building monuments to themselves, oil portraits on the wall, abusing each other, using each other, Egos out of control, like the rooster who thought the sun came up just to hear him crow. Everyone's name is Saddam Hussein until you get a new name. Everyone's name is Saddam Hussein until you get a new name. Selfish Willie on the throne, everything he sees he wants to own. Everyone's name is Saddam Hussein until you get a new name. Jesus Christ is number one, the one who owns it all. He's shaking everything that can be shaken. Every false kingdom will fall. Receive Him. Believe Him. And you'll never be the same. You'll live forever. Because in His book, He will write your name, your new name. Everyone's name is Saddam Hussein until you get a new name. That's pride. Self-will. Uh, my kingdom, the I, me, my lie. I'm the center of the universe and, and this is my kingdom and therefore you are subject to me and if you won't let me manipulate you and control you, I will discard you and cast you out. That is, that is the, uh, the life expression of most human beings, all human beings, until they have a change of kingdom in their heart and they say, Lord Jesus, I'm your servant. I'm not insisting that you become mine. All right, now, uh, the pitiful, rebellious eye that's deified and alt, exalt, uh, exalted will take you out of a palace and put you in a rat hole. Wonderful picture right there with Saddam Hussein. And, um, and then when we, those who exalt themselves will be humbled. And then comes that S-H-A-M-E, uh, Satan's hellish attack on me. Because I'm, Satan's the father of lies. There's no truth in him. We see that in John 8. And... Uh, Therefore, when I agree with him and he tells me I'm number one, that makes me subservient to every other lie. He'll even tell me I got the right to judge you or other human beings. Pick up your bag of stones and throw them at other people, Bob. And that's when uh, all those judgments bring slander and criticism and gossip out of my mouth. And what am I doing? I'm sitting there in judgment of this person and that person. I'll see a complete stranger in the mall and I'll judge them by the way they walk or how they dress. 
you know, when I'm living, this pitiful, rebellious I being deified and exalted. And so uh, that always ultimately brings shame. Now, humility is when we have a, a regime change in our heart. And we simply say, Lord Jesus Christ, you're the center of the universe, not me. I'm just a moment in this earth. You are forever. And I want and I desire and I'm willing to make it my only ambition to please you. Now lead me, Lord. And you know, the amazing thing is, is he's not leading you to go places that you don't want to go. He inspires you to go. I said, well, if I, could, if I surrender to God, he'll lead me to be a missionary in China. Come on. You know, Lord, I'm willing. When I say, Lord, I'm willing, then, I, uh, then basically what happens is uh, delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. That's uh, uh, Psalm 37. Delight yourself in the Lord. He's, he's not primarily interested in what we do. He's interested in us. It's not about regulation. It's about relationship. He just wants to be a friend. Now, wherever he's going to lead you, you're going to want to go. When he's your Lord, you'll be inspired to go. You'll be excited about going. You know, I'm fixing to take a trip into, it uh, looks like, got the plane tickets and everything into uh, uh, what the, uh, the headlines are saying is a dangerous place. And my wife doesn't want me to go, but I'm excited about going. I'm inspired to go. I know who I'm going with. And uh, so we can walk through life fearless when we are tending to this relationship with this person who's not primarily interested in what we do or don't do. He's interested in you. Once you get that, Look, I want to be your friend. Delights yourself in me, and I'll give you the desire of your heart. And the desire of your heart's my desire, and I'll give that to you. And you'll desire to do my will. You won't give it a second thought. You'll just find yourself doing it because you're discovering what a friend I have in Jesus. It's all about knowing him, not knowing about him. Some people take that scripture, delight yourself in the Lord, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. And they say, oh, praise you, Jesus, praise you, Jesus, praise you, Jesus. Now give me this and give me that. Give me the desires of my heart. Well, if you're really delighting yourself in Him, your desires are His desires. And your only desire is to please Him when you truly see how much He loves you. Three, the integrity of the upright will guide them. Now see, that integrity is, is the opposite of those dishonest scales. The integrity of the upright will guide them but perversity of the unfaithful will destroy them. Now, anytime you see but, you're about to see the contrast, which is a commentary on what was before the but. So the contrast to integrity is unfaithfulness. See, when you're walking in, in integrity, you're faithful to the one who's faithful to you. And you're not uh, living in perversity when you're walking in integrity. Four, Riches do not profit in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. Okay? Sometimes the righteous are blessed with riches, but it's not gravy that you swim in, it's gravy that you pass on. And when you realize who you belong to and who all this earth belongs to, then you realize that you are a steward over what's his. A uh, dear friend told me one day, an elderly man, he said, uh, the gospel's free, but it takes money to get it out there, pump it out there. And I said, well, that's right. And, and our, our father who owns it all uh, has no lack. And when he guides, he provides. When he gives the vision, he gives the provision. But our hearts don't go after the riches. Our hearts go after him. And we just delight that he's blessed us. Uh, you know, we're not, uh, when we really think about in America today and you look at history and you look at how people live in the other, other parts of the world, our lower class is, is within the top, uh, like 97 percentile or the top 3% standard of living of every human being on the planet or who has ever lived. We are a very rich nation. Uh, go with me to the, to the back uh, hills of uh, Ukraine and see those ruddy roads. Our worst roads are their best roads. 
you know, go and stay in the home of people who don't have any waste of food because they're interested in surviving and uh, go outside and use their outdoor toilets. You know, uh, sweat in that bed with no air conditioning. Raise the window and let the mosquitoes come in and get whatever breeze you can get. That's a lifestyle for our friends there and certainly in other parts of the world. All right now, the riches of this country uh, are uh, there, you know, to, to bless and help others. I heard uh, a man say one time, look, Live simply that others may simply live. And when there's a regime change in my heart, then I begin to look at things differently and I'm not buying me stuff. You know, I'm an expression of his life in the planet because I realize the day of wrath, of judgment, is rapidly approaching. And it will be really... Uh, uh, inconsequential of how much did I have. Someone said that uh, six feet's the common denominator of all men. And whether you be a Rockefeller or a ragamuffin, it's all the same on the day of wrath. And he says, now righteousness delivers from death. You can certainly walk in the path of righteousness and be a financier of God's work. Thank God for those faithful souls who do. Uh, one uh, footnote right here. The psalmist says, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or their seed begging bread. And I remember that verse. Whenever I hear a minister pleading and begging for money, the seed of the righteous don't have to beg for bread. And uh, therefore, if there's any begging, Whose seed is that? Or manipulation. Let me show you one uh, subtle means of manipulation. If you hear, for a gift of so much money, we'll send you. Now, obviously, we will not send you the Celebrity Evangelist's Lady's book if you don't send us a gift of so much. That's not a gift. Our love gift to you for your support. Do you see the deceit? the dishonest scales. If you've got to give a gift in order to get their gift, then you're buying something. And that, to me, would make anything they share suspect. And those riches, whether it's a wealthy preacher, uh, merchandising, uh, what he calls as the word, he or she, you know, or whether it be a business tycoon who's legitimately uh, uh, earning through sale of goods and services. It's not going to profit on the day of wrath. Five, the righteousness of the blameless will direct his way aright, but the wicked will fall by his own wickedness. Now, we're reminded over and over that there's nothing more wicked than calling God a liar. Unbelief is wickedness. Now, this will really break it down simply. If you are tormented in your life, if I'm tormented in my life, you know, if, I, if I'm living in whining and complaining and negativism, I may blame you. I may blame circumstances. I may blame this. I may creditors. I may blame this and blame that. But every tormented soul is an unbelieving soul. And every crisis is a faith crisis. I don't believe, God, that you'll never leave me or forsake me. I don't believe that goodness and mercy are going to follow me all the days of my life and I'll dwell in your house forever. I don't believe that's the root of my nightmare. All fear. I don't believe you love me. Therefore, I'm clinging to all these things around me. That's wickedness, unbelief. Now, when we'll deal with it on that level, you remember over in uh, John 16, when Jesus says to his disciples, it's to your advantage that I go away. And they're wondering, what does he mean? He's leaving us. And he said, no, I'm going to send the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, 
who will guide you in all truth, and he will convict or convince the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Of sin because they don't believe in me. Now what's this? All sin is the result or the expression of unbelief. And what do I not believe? I don't believe the Word. And what is the Word saying? The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and He demonstrated His love at Calvary 2,000 years ago. That's what the Word is saying. The Word is saying, I'll give my life to heal you, and I love you, and I'm just going to come out of the tomb and be raised from the dead to show you who I am. Now, will you let me? Now, watch how wicked a legalism is. I got to do right to be right. That's do do religion. It's not do 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 do. It's done 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 at Calvary. Belief says I'm forgiven. John fifteen three is true. You're already clean by the word he's spoken to you. And I'm not just forgiven so I can clean up my act. I'm forgiven so I can quit acting and let him be my friend right where I am and escape the corruption of the world through the knowledge of him. That's the way Peter put it. If I believe I'm loved with a perfect love, then I won't be looking for it somewhere else. What do I not believe? I don't believe I'm loved with a perfect love. Therefore, I go try to get it somewhere else because that's my deepest need. You know, a child can see that, but the wise in their own eyes can't see it, miss it. So we fall by our wickedness, our unbelief, calling God a liar. Calvary wasn't enough for me, Lord. Look what a lie, guilt, regret, and shame is. Guilt going under in living torment. Again, shame, Satan's hellish attack on me. Regret, rejecting grace, receiving torment. When I live that lie, I'm saying, in effect, the blood he shed at Calvary was not enough for me. I've been too bad. Sorry, Jesus. Your suffering and the hell you went through and your death on the cross is not enough to forgive me. That's what guilt, regret, and shame does. You have to stiff arm Jesus to live in hell and go there. You have to trample on his blood to live a tormented life. And it's all centered in unbelief, wickedness, calling God a liar. Wow. Six, the righteousness of the upright will deliver them, but the unfaithful will be caught by their lust. L-U-S-T. Living under sensual torment. Now, that's not just sexual lust. Here's a definition of lust. I've got to have it now. I've got to have it now. Well, why have you got to have it now? Because that's the only thing that will satisfy me. And when I grab it and I get it, it doesn't satisfy me at all. It pacifies me for a moment, but then I have contempt for it, and I go lusting after something or somebody else. I want it now. You can lust for money. You can lust for prestige. You can lust for this. You can lust for a piece of painted steel that runs around in circles. You can lust, lust says, I got to have it now. Now, the reason unfaithfulness uh, is expressed through lust and the, and the reason lust is the way unfaithful people act is because unfaithful people don't know that God Almighty is faithful to you and to me. It's his faithfulness. That's righteousness. Righteousness means to agree with God. Agree with him. What does he say? He says, I love you and I want to be your shepherd and protect you. I've already forgiven you. If you could do right to be right, then I wouldn't have had to die for you. But I did, and I took all of the wrath that your S-I-N, self-indulgent nature, deserves on me at Calvary. And you don't have to live under a bunch of expectations. You get to live in uh, the peace and the joy that comes from knowing that you stand before the judge of the universe, before the judge before whom every human being will stand, including the judges of this earth. And he says to you, innocent. Well, yeah, but I did, I did, look, don't try to talk me out of loving you. You're innocent on the basis of the death of my son, not your works. You mean? My heart's been broken by the burden of betraying the only one who ever loved me enough to die. I know I'm so undeserving. Each time I try to serve him, I fall so far behind until I cry. Jesus, why 
would you even offer me the time of day? You've got every reason to leave me here and go your own way. I know I deserve your judgment, Lord, for being so untrue. And then he smiles. He says, come here, child. Who, me? Yeah, you. Listen to me. No matter what you have done and no matter what you do, you'll never keep me from loving you. I even tried to talk him out of loving me, but he just wouldn't listen, wouldn't pay me no mind. I even tried to talk him out of loving me, and he said, child, stop wasting our time. Now, what are you going to do with a love like that? Lord, into your arms I fall. Suffering love held nothing back. Take this wretched soul, my God. I surrender all. I even tried to talk him out of loving me, but he just wouldn't listen, wouldn't pay me no mind. I even tried to talk him out of loving me, and he said, child, stop wasting our time. Now I'm no longer wasting our time. Seven, when a wicked man dies, his expectation will perish, and the hope of the unjust perishes. The righteous is delivered from trouble. Oh, I love that right there. Doesn't mean you're not going to get to go through some trouble waters, but you're delivered from them. The sky was blue, but I was blind to it. Folks said, get yourself together, boy, but I didn't know exactly how to do it. Bound by their opinion of me, depressed as I could be, until I quit betting on luck, woke up. And now I'm knee slapping, heel kicking, high flying, God relying on the hallelujah truth that'll set you free. And I'm freer than a grease pig on the 4th of July. 90 to nothing, I'll fly right by. I'm happier than a clown who's found the sweet by and by. I'm freer than a grease pig on the 4th of July. Let freedom ring. I feel brand new. Trouble keeps grabbing at me, but I slip right through. The devil's plans are spoiled, and I'm covered in the Holy Ghost oil. Romans 8, 28 permeates everything that I say, pray, walk through, talk to, or do. And I'm delivered from trouble because I'm walking in the path of righteousness, and that is I'm agreeing with him. And when he shows me I'm going the wrong way, I know correction's not rejection, and I just start agreeing with him. I don't get offended or get my feelings hurt, man. Somebody's got to lead us out of here, but somebody's here to lead us out of here. It's called walking in the light, walking with a repentant heart, a humble heart before him. Lord, you show me the way, I'll come to it. I love that. You see that in somebody, they're going to make it. I'm teachable. I'm all ears. I know the way I've been doing, doing it's not working. Show me a more excellent way, and I'll walk in it. So here he comes. Uh, 2 Peter 1, 3, the next verse here, uh, 9, the hypocrite with his mouth destroys his neighbor. You know, and the hypocrite is, is saying one thing, uh, but, but uh, thinking another. And I'll tell you, if, if I judge you, I'm a hypocrite. I really am. I, don't, I can't throw stones at anybody. And I can't refuse to forgive anybody because I've been forgiven so much. And that gossip and slander, by your words you'll be justified, by your words you'll be condemned. Uh, Matthew 12, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speak. And I'll tell you, all that backbiting and uh, slandering and scorn and gossip about other people uh, is, uh, destroys them. And it also destroys the one who's doing it. We've got a double barrel shotgun, spiritually speaking. We've got a double barrel shotgun put in our hands. And we point it at other people and pull the trigger, failing to realize that one of those barrels is pointed back to us. And you give, and it's given back to you, good measure, shaken down, running together. Or is it given to you? And you give curses on other people, and you judge other people, it comes right back on you. You reap what you sow, and your life is cursed when you curse other people. Now, the way you reverse the curse, that works on the positive side, too. You start blessing those that curse you. And, you know, if you can't say something good about somebody, don't say anything at all. Well, don't even think it. And, you know, when those little darts, when the enemy shoots those darts in your mind and wants to get you to build a case against somebody else in your heart, uh-uh, stranger's voice, I'm not going to follow Jesus. Jesus, I pray you'll help me see that person with your eyes and you bless those that curse you. Now, let me tell you about uh, those people around you that you dislike. 
The commandment is not, you, is not like everybody, it's love everybody. Thank God. A person that gets on your nerves and you dislike, that's an opportunity for you to walk and lay your life down love that keeps the commandment and fulfills the whole law. So he sends these jerks into your life to see if you're going to bless them rather than curse them. <laughs> I believe that's some people's ministry. <laughs> He used to call us something else besides a jerk. But you know what I'm talking about. You know, it's like, yeah, why don't I have to work alongside this person? Or I'm going to avoid them. And in my heart, I'm not avoiding them. I'm judging them and I'm ridiculing them. Every, every time I think about them, Ugh. Listen, that Jesus died for that person also. They're forgiven also. So God, help me. I know I can't do it on my own, but I bless them. It's amazing how Jesus... Uh, the night before he was betrayed and he knew who would betray him. And he washed Judas's feet and called him friend. Bless those that curse you. It breaks the curse on your own life. Uh, now through the knowledge of righteous, the righteous will be delivered. Uh, now 2 Peter 1, 3 uh, lets us know that it's through the knowledge of God that we escape the corruption of the world. The goal of our instruction is that we nurture and develop a knowledge of God, that we come to know Him, not analyze Him or evaluate Him or have knowledge about Him. This is not a course in theology, the study of God. This is an opportunity for the Spirit of God to give us revelation so that we can allow Him to be our friend that sticks closer than a brother. Come on, receive Him. Receive Him in the yard. He wants to befriend you, and He's Almighty God. And He's here to pick you up each time you fall. Now, what are you going to do with a love like that? Let him love you and walk in the light, living and overcoming in the victor's embrace, L-O-V-E. That's the love of God that never fails. That's the love of God that raises the dead. That's the love of God that allows the fruit of the Spirit to be expressed through your life. Gentleness, joy, patience, meekness, temperance, faith, the embodiment of L-O-V-E. That's Galatians 5.22. Do you want to walk in that today? Do you want to have life and have it in abundance? It simply comes by letting Jesus Christ be your friend. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining us. This is Bob McLeod. If you'd like more information concerning Our Father's Arms, you can write us at Our Father's Arms, Post Office Box 1158, Jacksonville, Alabama 36265, or visit us on the web at www.ourfathersarms.org. May the Lord Jesus Christ continue to give us eyes to see the unseen. Amen. Love descending deeper than our feelings and love expanding Beyond our minds Love Transcending Space and time Jesus loves you Do you know